Okay. So eventually we reach the period of carbon fusion. This is when the star starts to make things like oxygen and nitrogen. So um, oxygen is one of the possible products that carbon fusion can yield. And so my question for you is, based on the number of nucleons in the carbon and the number in the oxygen, um, what would it take to produce oxygen starting with carbon? Okay, I see most votes for D that helium four would be required. And that's exactly right. So if we start with 12 nucleons of carbon and then add four nucleons from a helium four or alpha particle, then we get 16 nucleons to make oxygen. All right, this isn't the only process that happens during carbon fusion though. There's actually a whole lot of stuff that happens during carbon fusion, but this is one of the things that happens. And so um, one way to think about what's going on here is that we've got our carbon um, core and now we're starting to build up some oxygen ash in the center of the star again. And then outside of the oxygen core is where the carbon burning region is. So the carbon in the oxygen core is depleted, but there's plenty of carbon just outside of that. Um, outside of that, we still have our helium burning shell. Outside of that, we still have our hydrogen burning shell. And then finally, on the outside, we have our non-burning hydrogen area of the star. So there's all these layers going on inside of our star. Um, they're not necessarily you know, perfectly distinct. There's some mixing that happens within the star the total extent of that mixing process is actually still a topic of current research. And it's something that we use helioseismology to study in the sun. And so I, I mentioned a long, long ago that helioseismology helps us understand the evolution of stars. This is why, because it tells us how much the fuel is mixing within our own sun. And that can tell us how much the fuel is mixing within these evolving stars. So again, the layers are not perfectly distinct. You wouldn't be able to you know, find the boundaries between them like the layers of an onion. Maybe they're not like onions at all, they're like ogres. So starting in our carbon fusion process, if we have a um, carbon nucleus and then it's joined by one proton, so a hydrogen one, then that will release some energy as it fuses into carbon, or sorry, nitrogen 13. Um, now after this, the nitrogen 13, right, this is seven protons plus six um, neutrons, this can actually um, decay into a carbon 13, but in order to do so, one of its protons had to change into a neutron, and so that positive charge going from a proton to a neutron had to go somewhere, and where it went is a positron. There's also a little bit of a mass difference, and the extra mass became a neutrino. So now we, again, have a carbon 13, um, a proton, again, can join with this carbon-13 to produce nitrogen-14, which is the normal kind of nitrogen. This also produces a gamma ray. So this is the second type of energy output um, possible in our cycle so far. Now, this can also join with a proton to produce oxygen-15, which is um, one um, neutron shy of being a regular oxygen nucleus. This produces a gamma ray again. Um, and then this can decay into nitrogen 15. So again, a proton changed into a neutron, releasing a positron and a neutrino, just like the um, case before when nitrogen 13 decayed to carbon 13. And now finally, um, nitrogen 15 can join up with a proton to produce a carbon 12 and a helium 4. So 16 total nucleons of our uh, from the nitrogen and hydrogen, and then 16 total because carbon-12 plus helium-4. Okay, so we have our entire CNO cycle and um, basically lots of different byproducts can result, right? So we end up with various nitrogen and oxygens uh, as part of this process. So this is what I meant before when I said lots of interesting nuclear reactions are possible within the star. And these are all, well, some of these processes are indeed producing energy. Okay, so coming back to our stellar evolution flow chart, we started on our mean sequence hydrogen burning. Then we went through a helium flash and entered a period of carbon um, fusion, so helium burning. 
And now we just saw that we can enter the CNO cycle and um, produce oxygen through the carbon burning process. So this is where we have ended up for our low mass stars. Uh, and during this carbon fusion, um, this is kind of the last possible fusion process for a low mass star. It will never reach the internal temperatures and pressures that are needed to fuse the results of the carbon fusion process. So it's not going to burn oxygen. It's not going to burn nitrogen. Uh, instead, this is the final throw of the star. Um, it's envelope, the outer non-burning envelope, that's going to be ejected away from the star um, as a planetary nebula. And the planetary nebula phase um, can produce a range of different temperatures and luminosities. So just broadly, it's depicted as a wide arc on the HR diagram. So this gas is flying away from the star, pushed away from the, uh, the pressures from the star's interior. All right, so if we start now from our helium burning phase on our flowchart, going through our CNO cycle, um, if a star is less than eight solar masses, it will go directly into this planetary nebula phase. 